So, um, yesterday Rick Satala talked about uh, a future where we might have a majority of our body in new body parts. And I thought, hey, the best that money can buy. <laughs> Um, and, and that leads me to our next uh, speaker because uh, the big new movement in medicine, of course, is to uh, anticipate problems rather than respond to them after the fact. And uh, scanning, uh, tricorders, uh, biotechnology is really uh, the next big wave and uh, Astro Teller is a guy who is uh, leading that wave. I love his name, actually, Astro. It reminds me of the old RCAF motto, remember? Per ardua ad astra. Through adversity to the stars. And Teller, I've been meaning to ask you, is it Teller as in the Teller? The Teller from science? The Teller from nuclear that one. subs? Yes, yeah? that's my grandfather. No kidding. A great lineage. Thanks for having me. Astro Teller. <laughs> So in uh, 1941, the U.S. was just getting into the war, but the war was already pretty developed for the Brits, and the war was going really, really badly for the Royal Air Force in particular. Uh, you know, they were sending out their planes. They had to defend British airspace. They were making sorties across the English Channel to try to fight the Germans on the other side. Um, so there were dogfights in the air, but they were getting strafed mostly from the bottom. And they were losing planes, and obviously the pilots and the gunners, at a completely unsupportable rate. Something had to be done. So the RAF had a, a special section called the ORS, the Operational Research Section, that had been working on this problem for about two years already, uh, pretty much since the beginning of the war. And it was just a really hard problem. I mean, the, the, the thing that you would do, right, is you would just put, like, big armor plating on the bottom of the planes and everything would be okay. But then the planes are so heavy that they can't get anything done, right? So there's no point sending them out. So you could put a little bit of armor plating there, but not a ton, uh, literally. Uh, and, and where to put it was really non-obvious because you had to defend the pilot, obviously, the gunners, it would be nice. Assert the munitions, you hit those and things go bad. The fuel, the fuselage, the engines, etc. Steering mechanisms. So where do you put what little bits of armor plating you can put on the bottom of the plane? And it made it worse that once the bullets entered the plane, they would tend to ricochet, um, probably in ways that could have been predicted, except that they were just way too complicated. And it was pretty hard to simulate the real conditions. So they, they kind of written it off as an unsolvably complex problem. But that was not going to work since they were actually asking these guys to go out and fly these planes and, and have these dogfights. Uh, so in a fit of desperation, they invited a, a mathematician from a local university to come look at the planes. And this guy showed up, you know, tweed jacket, fuzzy hair. And uh, he didn't talk to anybody. He just disappeared under one of the planes almost immediately. And, you know, so they just wrote him off. I think they completely forgot about him. So a week later, he shows up. I think everyone's just surprised that he was still on the base at all. <laughs> and, and he apologized for having taken a week to come up with their solution. And he said, well, so here it is. And he spread out this big piece of cray paper. And they said, you're an academic. You know, there's this really roughly drawn silhouette at the bottom of the plane. And there were these funny amoeba shapes on it. And he said, well, that's where you should put the armor plating. And they said, you're a kook, but <laughs> uh, we'll humor you. Why do you think that's where we, you should put the little bit of armor plating we can afford? And he said, well, that's where there were no bullet holes. And they said, oh, you're not an academic. You're a lunatic. <laughs> we're going to take this tiny amount of armor plating that we can afford and put it on the places that the planes don't get hit? Go away. And he said, well, it's a little complicated. Just think about it for a second. We, we can't look at the planes that we really care about. They're in the bottom of the English Channel. These planes have one thing in common. None of these planes were hit in these places. And that turned out to be the insight that the RAF needed. And it worked better than they could have hoped for. So 
what I wanted to talk about today, I actually didn't really know what I wanted to talk about today till last night, but people got me excited to talk about being excited. That's what I've really enjoyed about this conference so far. So there, I, I thought, what, is, what makes me leap out of bed in the morning? And <clears throat> I came up with it about three minutes ago. There are two things that make me leap out of bed in the morning. One of them is that story. I really believe that an increasing number of very hard, very important problems will be solved by looking away from, I don't just mean engineering problems, will be solved by looking away from where the bullet holes are and focusing and thinking more deeply about where the bullet holes aren't. I'll give an example of that in a second. But and I'm talking more with my business person and scientist hat on, not with my um, other hats on. But the other thing that really gets me up in the morning is the very simple but very profound idea that poor access to valuable information creates really inefficient processes. So for example, uh, sailors, before they could take small, accurate clocks out to sea with them, just had to live without longitude. It was pretty bad. They mostly got lost, they mostly went down, the cargo mostly went stale, even if it came home in time, or even if it came home at all. Very inefficient. Um, investors. You know, American, Canadian investors just didn't invest much overseas until the late part of the 19th century because it took weeks to find out what was going to happen, what had already happened there. They were at this massive disadvantage relative to the people in Europe because there was no way the transatlantic cable hadn't been run yet. Very inefficient process. The, all the, most of the really important things that, that mankind has invented have all had this feature. The printing press, the microscope, the telescope, the telegraph, the uh, internet. So, what are you gonna do with that? I mean, doesn't it bug any of you that it doesn't bug you? that we always kind of feel like we're there now. You know what I mean? Like, oh, now thank God we've got the internet. You know, we, we, the printing press seemed like that was the knowledge distribution problem. But now we really know the answer, right? It's the internet. But we've always got our blinders on. We're always comfortable with, with where we are. Or, or to put it another way, we put up with the existing inefficiencies, the remaining inefficiencies, let's say, without a squawk. And it's not the technology that prevents us from getting at these new kinds of information. The printing press could have been made 300 years before it was. It was just nobody thought about doing it because no one was really bugged by it. So one of the things I would like you to take away from this talk, if you take something away, is what bugs you? What kind of information do you want? You want to know about the future? That's okay, it sounds impossible. If you want the future, want the future. Want to know something, want to know everything about the future. Go make that possible. I'll bet Michael Adams, who talked a uh, day before yesterday, would love to know the aggregate uh, attitudes of every single Canadian on any particular topic instantaneously. That sounds impossible, but so did the printing press, so did the internet, so did the microscope, so did the telegraph. Don't let that stop you. So, Homework assignment. All of you need to go home, figure out something that really bugs you that we don't have access to, and go invent it. All right. You know, nobody said, I, I'm sure that there were um, technologies that just didn't give us access to really interesting information. And they withered on the vine because people said, so. But nobody said, so what, about the printing press. They said other things. They said, like, well, we can't give everybody books. That would be dangerous. OK, rule number one, when people say that something's going to be dangerous for, to give knowledge to people, to give information to people, you're onto something important. Do it. <laughs> or they would say, why would we print books for everybody? No one can read. <laughs> All right. Rule number two, society will go through any amount of change to be able to take advantage of world-changing information. Never bet against that. Am I getting an amen? We need more of those. Yeah! 
Hallelujah. So, you know, when they, when they uh, were talking about the telegraph in the early days, particularly about the transatlantic cable, there was this incredible brouhaha. A couple people would sort of grudgingly, the naysayers would go grudgingly say, yeah, instantaneous information over long distances, maybe there's something there. I don't know what it is. I doubt it, but maybe. But it's completely impractical to think that we're going to lay wires all around the world. I mean, think about it for a second. It's not going to happen. And particularly ridiculous to think that we're going to lay a cable across the Atlantic. If you think that's going to happen, you've never been there. Right? <laughs> Rule number three. The price to adopt new technologies will always be paid because, and I mean particularly to get at these kinds of world-changing information, they'll always be paid because the payoffs on the other side, when you remove those inefficiencies, are just too big not to. So the internet's an example of those rules. You know, we didn't know how disconnected we'd been until we got connected. Um, the worldwide wireless infrastructure is an example of those rules. So um, I will uh, give you what I believe is sort of the next big one, uh, near and dear to my heart, and it's unobtrusive wearable body monitoring. The, so that's the invention. The information that comes along with that is an all the time, in detail view of what's going on with the human body. Not in the hospital, here, all the time, in your natural environments. Does that matter? That's right, that's the first question we're supposed to ask. So two thirds of healthcare costs come from the choices that we make on behalf of our bodies, but we have no idea what's going on with our own bodies. We have no clue, we have no feedback, we have no basis for changing our behavior or for sticking with something if it's working. And our caregivers, the doctors, the nurses, the physical therapists, the personal trainers, they're nice people, they're trying to help, but they're in the dark like we are. In fact, they know less than we do because we have these sort of gut feelings about our body. You know, Tesh probably more than the rest of us. But we have gut feelings and, you know, we're not quite sure and we're often kidding ourselves. And then we self-report, but we're like lying because we don't really want to say to our caregivers what's going on. We're going to look back a generation from now, not several, one generation from now, at a healthcare system that tried to help us without this information and go, huh? In the exact same way as if I had a broken leg and I came into the emergency room and I was like, my leg's broken. And they'd say, well, I don't know. And they'd kind of check out my leg. We want to put a cast on it. You haven't even looked inside it yet. Please take the x-ray. And they would say, x-ray? What's an x-ray? No, 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 we just sort of look at the outside of your leg. And I'd say, I'm going to another hospital, right? You would never let somebody now make a decision without looking at that information. We're gonna feel like that about this information in one generation, I absolutely guarantee you. And this is not just about healthcare, it sort of got sucked into this healthcare description, but you know, your son's a college athlete, um, my wife is pregnant, um, your daughter who's one year old has a fever um, for entertainment, for pornography that we're gonna hear later, for the firefighter who works down the street, your body is the most important thing you have. And we know more about our cars or our stock portfolios. And there's no industry in which the human body is not important. <laughs> so um, when, we, when my company started to work on this thing five years ago, we, I don't know a nice way to say this, we were just, we were laughed out of all the offices we went into, basically, often fairly politely, but you know, the doctors, the venture capitalists, the users, they all basically said the same thing. They said, it's been tried, can't be done, don't go there. They said, you can't make something that's accurate and comprehensive, but that would also fade into the background of my life, like my wedding ring does, that I would just sort of wear all the time. And of course, it's gonna have to be cheap enough that we could all have them. And even if you could do all that and solve the wearability problem, even if you could do that, I don't really care about blood pressure. I don't care about beats per minute. What, are you gonna take my cholesterol once every you know, second? Who cares, it's not even changing that fast. If you could get the unmonitorable stuff, the stuff that nobody knows, even in the hospital, that is things like, how am I sleeping at night? And how come sometimes I don't sleep at night? If you could tell me why, now I'll sign up. 
If you could give me a hydration meter so I know I'm feeling dragged out, not because I need caffeine or food, because I'm just dehydrated. Or an overhydration meter so I know to take to go to the bathroom before I come into this meeting so I don't have to go in the middle, right? <laughs> If I'm trying to stop smoking or lose weight or cope with my diabetes or train for um, my first marathon, I mean, yeah, give me a dashboard for my body about those things. Now I'll sign up. But it's impossible. I don't like that phrase. Merz is exactly right. The, the people who make stuff need is that one of their first attitudes to just not like that phrase. Um, we had a secret weapon. And our secret weapon was that we had figured out to look where the bullets weren't. And there's one way to take away from that story about the RAF, the, the idea just try something different. But I mean something more specific. There's a, a more important um, allegory in that story. The, when the mathematician showed up on that airbase, he didn't get all wound up about the fact that there were smart airplane people there, the aeronautics experts and the munitions experts and the armor plating guys, whatever they're called. It's not that he disrespected them, it's that he over-respected them. He completely respected them. He said, if you guys can't figure it out, I certainly won't be able to figure it out that way. So he took everything they were trying to study and he put it over here in a black box and he said, if this problem can be solved, it can be solved without looking in that black box because the experts can't figure it out. It's a pretty radical thing to do, but it wasn't because he didn't think they were smart. He just acknowledged they were way smarter than he was on that particular issue. We've done exactly the same thing with getting information about the human body. The last hundred years of body monitoring has produced not much good. Let's put it that way. Um, really, there, there isn't much hospital-y stuff that makes it out of the hospital. And then what they've basically done is they take the big hospital stuff and they make little hospital stuff, which you're supposed to sort of self-apply, even though they tell you that you're dumb, so you shouldn't know how, but then they encourage you to self-apply it while you're at home. And then all you get for your trouble is sort of low-grade hospital-y information, which is really designed to be periodic anyway, so it doesn't make much sense to have at home. The, the whole enterprise hasn't been very successful. There was no way that we were going to be smarter than the last hundred years of human physiology experts and biomedical experts. But what if we said we didn't care how the human body worked? What if we said that we were going to study the data, we were going to model the data instead of modeling the system? What if we were going to make or find relationships between the data coming off of the human body and what happened to the human body with out, and this is the black box over here. We're just going to put in that black box how the body works. It's like saying, what if the information isn't in the plane? What if all you need to know is right there on the bottom surface of the plane? And it turns out, five years later, after we started the company, that it works. It works better than we could have hoped for. Um, and in fact, the people who you might think would be our biggest critics, the human physiology experts, are actually now some of our biggest proponents, writing papers and, and publishing them, because they're the people who are most desperate to have some quantitative tools to study you people, all of us, out in the real world. So they're actually very excited about this. So I promised you an example. Um, my company actually makes a number of different things, but this is an example of what it looks like. This has a computer, a processor, um, memory, sensors, um, and it's just watching my body many times a second and making or using statistical algorithms that have been built out of a lot of this data. So lest it sound like I'm taking the victory lap for wearable body monitoring, which it probably does a little bit, <laughs> this is the beginning of the story. And very predictably so. Every single time that really important new information has suddenly been made available to us, the next thing that has to happen is the applications, the use of that information, the molding, the bringing the value out of that information. That has to be the next step. And what it's going to be and how to do it is never, never obvious. So, Imagine that Zacharias Janssen in 1595 runs out of his house with the world's first compound microscope, like Archimedes you know, yelling Eureka down the street in his uh, birthday suit. 
And, and he's like, yeah, you know, for the first time, we can actually see really, really small things. We can see things so small we've never seen them before, the, the building blocks of the world. And he was probably overstating the case a little bit since it was like a factor nine magnification, but, <laughs> but no worse than I just did about ours. So I will forgive him and me at the same time. And then the, like, the herring vendor on the street corner in Amsterdam says, cool, dude. So, so like, give me some super sweet example. <laughs> there's, there's no example. He had no idea. He'd made the microscope, and that was good. I mean, that's not a bad thing. But that's just the invention. It opens the doors to the possibilities. It isn't. Uh, you know, uh, medicine, chemistry, biology, they all exploded as a direct result of that invention. But the microscope isn't medicine. It just made a lot of medicine possible, like what Ava was doing. It, you know, uh, another way of thinking about it, it's not like there was some stock ticker company that was really having a hard time making a living in the like mid 1800s. And then along came the telegraph, uh, the telegraph. And all of a sudden their business picked up, right? It, what happened was that the idea of moving the information instantaneously between two points happened. And then afterwards, somebody made the telegraph or the stock ticker, right? That was a business idea, an application that built on top of this medium, this invention. And that's always the way it has to be. Because you have to look into your blind spot, see, need that new information, get access to the new information, and then you can start to turn the crank. Right, the stock ticker and 99 other tele-ideas, those were the things that made the telegraph and all of its descendants so, po so uh, powerful. So I'm, I'm obviously giddy about the possibilities of uh, the, knowing the physical and mental states of people in real time in a really unobtrusive and cost-effective way, but I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, it's, it's like having the microscope. I, I have my guesses, as maybe Zacharias Janssen did, but that's not really the point. The world will have to turn the crank and, and find ways to harvest the value in these inventions. Obviously, we'll try to help. Uh, so I'm, I've been trying to use this continuous human uh, body information as an example of a bigger issue. I guess in the spirit of this conference, a uh, bigger idea. We know so little about the world. We have so many amazing things still to invent, to discover, to understand. And I believe more firmly than I can really explain that the, the most important things we still have to learn to figure out are ahead of us. But I believe as firmly that a lot of those veils will be broken through because we dare to be annoyed at those inefficiencies, to dare to look into those blind spots. So. Um, I guess I'll leave you with the thought I think whenever uh, I want to I remind myself that everything is possible. Whenever somebody says to me that something is impossible, this is the first sentence that goes through my mind, and, and maybe it can be for some of you too. Go look where the bullets aren't. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I want, I want to ask Oscar whether that's a practical product and is it on the market? Yeah, uh, this product is on the market. Actually, it's on several markets. Um, in the way I just described, it's a, it's a raw technology. So in fact, we already sell this into scientific research to the human physiologists, but we also sell it through other companies. Roche Diagnostics already sells this into the clinical weight management market. 
Um, it's actually being uh, rolled out right now in the uh, sort of fitness weight loss market inside health clubs in the United States. Um, by the end of this year in disease management. And then a lot of things are much more futuristic that would sort of take us several years to get onto the market. And if I strap one on, who would be reading the output? Again, it really depends. This is the underlying technology. If you are doing scientific research, you would never, or your patients uh, would never see the data. They'd bring the armband back to you or send the information back wirelessly, and then you would look at their data. If you're doing weight management and you've bought one of these from Roche Diagnostics, then at the end of the day, you'd sit it in front of your computer, you press a button, sucks your day's worth of data down automatically, and then you get the sort of reality check, basically a weightometer. Whether you're sort of losing or gaining weight for the day, calories in, calories out, and it gives you this grounding and this feedback, which is very different than standing on a weight scale uh, still fat, you know, it's, it's not the same. Right? So yeah, thanks Moses. <laughs>